Good morning, everybody. Morning. Let, me, let me jump the gun and say Happy New Year. Happy Blessed New Year. Wow. God has great things for this church, doesn't he? Yes. <clears throat> this is so exciting for me, and thank you, Pastor Kevin. What an honor and a privilege for Pam and I to be here and be able to minister the gospel of Jesus to one of the greatest churches in North America. Yes. Woo! And then also the privilege of being able to minister with my wife. Every time I get to minister with Pam, it's always an adventure. You know, I was thinking this morning, just as you and I were getting ready to minister, I was thinking about the time we had a concert in Louisville, Kentucky, and we flew in, we rented a car, and as we're driving to the, the venue, Pam looked at me and she goes, Honey, she goes, I just need to put some cream around your eyes because you got little bags underneath your eyes. And so being the loving wife that she is, she started putting cream around my eyes and she you know, very gently as I'm driving, putting cream around my eyes, and we pull into the parking lot of the church, and she looks over at me, she goes, what did you do? And I looked in the mirror, and I said, what did you do? <laughs> and my eyes had swollen up like, like two big red raccoon circles around yeah. my eyes. I just looked exactly like this, and Pam's like looking at me horrified, and I said, Pam, what'd you do? And she said, well, I read in a magazine that if you put Preparation H around your eyes, you'll get rid of the wrinkles in the bags. I learned my lesson. You're not going to do that anyway. <laughs> Ladies, just quit reading those articles. Don't, don't, don't put preparation H around your husband's eyes. <clears throat> if you've learned anything today, you've learned that. Don't do that. Yeah. It's such an honor to be here. Let's start by prayer. Father, we just thank you for this amazing group of people. We thank you for Mount Hope Church, Lord, for yeah. Pastor Kevin. And right now, Holy Spirit, we never want to take for granted access to your presence. We welcome you. Lord, what a privilege it has been just to be in your presence as we've been worshiping the Father. And God, right now, we just ask you to breathe, breathe your breath on the word of God. May it find its place in its heart. May it grow up quickly. May the roots grow down deep, Lord, and may it increase, bring lasting fruit in Jesus' precious name. So Amen. Amen. I believe the Holy Spirit has something very special for you today. Pastor Kevin wanted me to let you know that we have this one-year Bible in our resource center. This is for you to kick off your year. I know it's going to be a great blessing to you, so make sure afterwards you go to the resource center and get the one-year Bible. Fill your heart with the Word of God. I believe with all my heart that the Holy Spirit has something very precious for you going into this brand new season of your life. I believe that God has a breakthrough for you, for every one of you, not just this nebulous spiritual term breakthrough, but a breakthrough for you. Your life is unique. Your, your world, your realm, your sphere of influence is particularly to your story, and I believe that God has a breakthrough for you. For some of you, it may be a healing. For some of you, it may be a deliverance from an old habit. For some of you, it may be wisdom for your marriage, wisdom for raising your children. It could be a breakthrough in your finances, a breakthrough for your company, a next level. It could be, you might say, my life is good. Well, it may be a breakthrough from good to better to great. Amen. But God has a breakthrough for you. So I just want to encourage you this morning. I really believe that the Holy Spirit has put this word on our heart. It's not just because it ties into this next Wednesday night. You want to be there for a breakthrough prayer meeting. But I really believe that this is something for 2000 to transition from 2000 to 2018. God has something miraculous for you, a spiritual breakthrough in Jesus' precious name. Yeah. So here's what I'm going to do. Up front, right off the top, I'm going to give you all three points. Is that okay? Just because if your attention span, like you're kind of like your battery on your phone, it wears out really quick, I just want to make sure we get it under the door really <laughs> fast before you fall asleep. Is that okay? Number one, the first key to your breakthrough is repent. Repent. Right? Jesus came out of the wilderness. The very first thing he ever preached, the very first word out of his mouth in his public ministry was, change your thinking. And, you know, and I just want to say this. The tone wasn't like, you know, sometimes we hear that kind of street preaching like, repent. It was, repent. Like, yeah. I got good news. Change your way of thinking. Permission to change your way of thinking. You see, until we change our thinking, we can't change our living. Listen, I know that salvation's free. Jesus died on the cross to pay the price for you and me that we might be the sons of daughters. I love John 1, 12. To as many as received Jesus, to them God has given the power, the right, and the privilege to be the children of God. 
the sons and daughters of God. But that's not enough if you want the breakthrough. If you want to come through that door, you're going to have to change the way you think. Just because God has given you a blood transfer of his only begotten son and made you royalty doesn't mean you automatically think right. royalty. Right? Have you noticed that? You got saved and you still had a little piece of stupid thinking. You got to change the way you think. Royal identity is something you must learn. Can I say that again? Right. Royal identity is something you must learn. It doesn't come naturally. Amen. I tried that. I waited for it just to happen. It doesn't happen. Royal identity does not come naturally. It's a supernatural occurrence. To access your destiny, you must be trained to think your destiny, okay? First key, repent. You got to change your thinking. Number two, second key to your breakthrough is context. I learned this a long time ago. Context isn't just something. Context is everything. Context is everything. This is why Jesus said, seek first the kingdom of God. He was basically saying, seek first the eternal king's context. You got to seek it first. He didn't say, you know, for me, I had to learn the hard way. He didn't say, seek first ministry, Stephen. He said, seek first the kingdom of God. When you seek first the kingdom of God, God puts you in a context that is perfect for spiritual success. Who here wants spiritual success? Who here wants to live the breakthrough life? Yes, You've got every breakthrough has to have context. If you take it outside the context, it's a fish out of water. You got that? The kingdom of God is the one and only context for successful spiritual living. And that's why Jesus taught us to pray. He said, pray this way. Father, your kingdom come, your will be done. Your kingdom come, your will be done. You know how I used to pray? I used to just pray, Father, just your will be done. Just come on, just smack dab, put your will right here. And God's like, I have an order. My kingdom come, my will be done. You see that? The will always fits inside the kingdom. Mm -hmm. So many times what we want to do is we want to make the will of God be done outside the kingdom. That's holding the will of God in contempt. See, that's a legal term. You cannot hold the king in contempt of the kingdom. Right? Yes. Third key to your breakthrough. It's simple. It's true worship. Didn't we have an awesome worship mm -hmm. time this morning? True worship. Now listen to this. True worship has rewards that open up breakthrough doors. It's got to be true because it rhymes. <laughs> true worship has rewards that open up breakthrough doors. Come on, you want to say it, right? True, true worship, worship has, has rewards, rewards that, that open up, up breakthrough, breakthrough doors. doors. It sure enough does. In John 4, remember when Jesus is having a little conversation with the woman at the well, the Samaritan woman? And the conversation starts out about a cup of water. It's just about having a drink of water. And Jesus said, well, how about you give me a drink of water? How does the conversation in just a few minutes go from having a drink of water to suddenly her going to Jesus? you got to tell me, where do we worship? How does the conversation go from having a cup of water to worship? You see, because she recognized at some point that Jesus was a prophet, that he really heard from God. And even before she got the revelation that he was Messiah... She said to him, when she found out that he heard from God, she says, sir, you got to tell me. Please tell me. Now, us Samaritans, we worship over here. Nothing happens. You Jews, you worship over here. I can tell nothing happens for you. Listen, I, you already read my mail. I've been married five times. I've been living with a man. I've got to know where do we worship. How do we worship? Why did she want to know the truth about it? Because she said, I want an outcome. I don't want to just be religious. I've been religious and I got married five times and now I'm living with a man. It doesn't work. I need an actual outcome. I need to know how do we worship so that it honors and pleases God. And I can see a smile come on Jesus' face and he says, Dear, listen, the day is coming. It's now here when the true worshipers, this is Jesus talking. He said, the day has come when the true worshipers, you see, you can worship, but then there's true worship. The true worshipers will worship the Father in spirit and in truth. Do you see that? The Father in spirit and in truth, in the word. Isn't that good? Yeah. Three keys to you overcoming. All right, let's go have lunch. <laughs> <laughs> got to repent. You got to change your way of thinking. You got to be wary of context. You've got to know, seek first the kingdom of God. 
And number three, you've got to use access, true worship. True worship has rewards. It opens up breakthrough doors. So let's talk about number one, repent. Right, right Pammy? Yes, change our way of thinking. Number one, you've got to repent. You've got to change your way of thinking. This has been such a key in my life. I'm telling you, I, have, I think I'm the poster boy for stupid thinking. I've had so much stupid thinking in my life and I had to constantly... Every time I come to the word, it's like the word just keeps chipping off more stupid thinking. Jesus' first sermon in Matthew 4, 17, he began to preach, crying out, repent. I see a smile on his face. I see him talking to people that were under a load and a burden, and he was wanting to give them the breakthrough. And he goes, change your way of thinking. You can do it. Come on. Change. Let go of your old opinion. Change your way of thinking. You know, when I was, I, I received the Lord as a young boy. My mom led me to the Lord when I was just a child. But I'd been in the ministry since I was 15 years old. And after college, I got out of college, I was depressed. I was downhearted. I was in the ministry. I was working hard in the ministry. I was serving the Lord in the ministry. But the Holy Spirit woke, woke me up one night and he said, it was like he was just gently just touching me and just saying, Stephen, don't be conformed to this world. He spoke to me in Romans 12 too. Be transformed. How? by the renewing of your mind, proving what is that good, acceptable, and perfect will of God. You see, we are born again. Jesus gave us his royal blood transfer. We just haven't been adopted just with papers. We've been adopted with a, a royal blood transfer. But being royalty doesn't automatically make you live like royalty. We all need to be trained to live like royalty. Isn't that so? Look, before I met Pam, God started setting my heart up and basically telling me, he says, I, I got a wife for you. I got, I got a woman for you. But it was like the Lord going, but you got a lot of relationships, stupid thinking, Stephen. You, you just, let me be honest, your relationship dumb. And so I had to begin to submit my mind to the word of truth and have the Lord start peeling off of all. See, I was raised by a single mom. And, and, you know, my, my mom didn't, you know, there was no relationship between her and my dad. So I didn't know how a husband should treat a wife. And so God began to convert my thinking before he brought me to Pam. Can you imagine if I would refuse to let go of my stupid thinking and just insist on the will of God and step into a relationship with Pam? That wouldn't be very fair to her. My wrong thinking would have disqualified me from relationship with Pam. I remember our first date, the Holy Spirit was even working through Pam to help get me out of my my bad relationship thing. My first date with Pam, I knocked on the door. We walked out to the car. We're getting in the car, and I, I just jump in the car, and I look over there, and there's Pam just standing by the door, just quietly, patiently waiting. No judgment, no condemnation. No. She just was just sweetly just waiting. She's like, you know, he'll, he'll get it sooner or later. <laughs> I got out of the car. I walked around. I was thankful. I was like, God, you're... You're already training me. You're teaching me. Open the door. Because you see, it's not just even about the small things like that. You see, in the small things, the Holy Spirit was teaching me honor. He was teaching me respect. He was teaching me how to defer, how to prefer the other person. We have to learn. You have to learn relationships to qualify for the very next promotion of a relationship that God has for you. Yeah. Right? You can't be praying... You can't be praying for the wife of your dreams or the husband of your dreams and keep holding on to your opinion, right? That's going to hinder your breakthrough. Like I said earlier, you have to be trained to live like royalty. Royal identity is something you must learn. If it does, it does not come naturally to access your destiny, you must be trained to think your destiny. And it reminds me of uh, Romans 5.17. I so like the scripture. And it says, through the abundance of... Of grace and the gift of God's rightness we reign as kings in life through Christ Jesus you got to be trained to reign it takes time through the abundance of his grace and the gift of his rightness we can reign in life through Christ Jesus but you know that takes courage to step up and renew your mind it's a process that you can't keep up on you know I'm, I'm thinking of Galatians where it says don't be weary in well-doing, for in due season you will reap if you don't lose heart. And I don't know about you, but there's been times where I've given up, I've given in, 
I've lost heart. I fainted right, I mean, literally sometimes 24 hours before I was getting ready to reap for something. And, you know, I repent, and God's merciful to all of us, and he turns it back around, but it took a lot longer. So I don't know about you, but in 2018, I'm determined not to be weary in well-doing. I'm determined to reign as a king in life through Christ Jesus. I'm determined not to give up and not to lose face, faint and lose heart and grab on to all that God has for me that's spiritual in grit by getting in his way yeah. right that's spiritual grit yeah. you got to have some spiritual grit that's part of God you know like when I was younger I, I had no spiritual grit it was just like I, I expected kind of like a drive through window just like ask and receive and it's like no no respect for God's process no yeah. no respect for the process of the miraculous God is a God of process and so I had to have the Lord continue and he's still doing it teaching me the art of and the beauty of his heavenly process and there is so much good stuff you see God put Adam and Eve in the garden he didn't just the garden wasn't just kabam like that he put them he sowed a garden and they became part of the process of the garden growing up God expects us to get our minds renewed to kingly royal thinking if you're going to live royal you've got to think royal now you may be royal but you've got to have your mind converted there was a miner his name was Darby turn of the century during the gold rush in California and he had found some gold and he um, bought all this mining equipment and started drilling and he got enough gold to pay for all of his mining equipment but then all of a sudden the, the vein disappeared <clears throat> so he gets frustrated after a few months and he just gets tired and worn out and he gives up he doesn't pursue any no how many know that Hosea 4 6 says without God says my people are destroyed for what they don't know for lack of knowledge, right? So Darby, he just gives up, sells all of his equipment to this junk collector. This junk collector comes along, buys his equipment and his claim. Well, then he does something very miraculous. He calls a mining engineer, and he asks for some advice. Mm -hmm. He even pays for some counsel. And this mining engineer does some surveying, takes a look around. And he says, you know what, what I've discovered? This guy didn't know anything about the California fault lines. And he said, if you just drill three feet over this way, you're going to hit the, you're going to hit the, the mother load. Guess what the, the, the junk collector did? He did exactly what he was counseled to do. He moved over 36 inches. He drilled down 36 inches, and there you go. He hits one of the biggest California gold strikes of all time, became a multi-multi-millionaire way back hundreds of years ago. Listen, are you really willing to miss your breakthrough for 36 inches? No. Are you seriously, in 2018, willing to step off and miss your breakthrough for 36 inches? You're this close, but there's something that you need to know that you right now, is it possible at all that God has something for you that you don't know? Is it I know you know a lot of stuff, but is it possible there's just something you don't know that could just give you that breakthrough and push you through to the other side? Right, But until we're, until we're unwilling to tolerate our ignorance anymore, our spiritual blindness, we can't change it. We can, we can pray for 20, 30 years standing at the door looking for a breakthrough and never step through because we're willing to tolerate our ignorance. I am fed up. I don't want to tolerate one more moment of what I don't know. Jesus said to me, he said, Stephen, he says, I got many things to say to you, but you can't handle it. I want to be able to handle it. Don't you want to be able to handle it? It's going to require changing your thinking. Look at this. Old thinking versus renewed thinking. Old thinking, carnal thinking doesn't recognize the breakthrough door. It's like, oh, it's just a simple door. What's the big deal? Old thinking sees the giant as a problem, the doorway, but the, the new renewed thinking, David, the shepherd boy's thinking, he sees the giant as an opportunity. He sees the giant as finally promotion. Promote, I stepped through this thing. See, everybody else was praying the giant away. All the other Israelites, they're like, oh, please, God, just make the, the door go away. Make the giant go away. David, the shepherd boy, comes along, and he sees what nobody else sees. He sees the giant as an opportunity. He sees the giant as an opportunity to overcome, get the king's daughter, get all the wealth, all the rewards. He had royalty on the inside of him, back on the backside of the wilderness, raising the sheep. God was instilling by his word royal thinking in royal living. Yeah. 
And so when he came along, when nobody else could recognize the giant for what it was, David saw the giant as an opportunity. Isn't that good? Yep. Philippians 2.5, it says, let this mind be in you, which was also in Christ Jesus. I realize every day I got to let the mind of Christ be in me. I got to give permission to the mind of Christ to be in me. Yes, I'm born again, but I have to have my mind renewed every day. I got to let the thinking of Jesus be on the inside of me. Peter was preaching after Jesus was crucified, raised from the grave, and ascended to the Father's right hand. He's preaching in Jerusalem to the angry mob now that had crucified Jesus just a few days earlier. He's preaching to them, and there's such a conviction comes over the angry mob. And they're like, this is how they respond to Peter's preaching. They say in Acts 2, verse 37, they say, what shall we do? And Peter says to them, repent, change your view, change your point of view. Some of us, we're so in love with our point of view, we don't, we just, we got our point of view and we don't realize we're trying to take it through the door here and it's like, well, well, I know God's called me to a breakthrough, but I want to bring my point of view. And for some reason, your point of view has been magnified or or magnetized so it won't go through. Every time you try to bring your point of view, so some of you are so in love with your point of view, you can't get through the door. The door's right. You've been praying for 20 years to get through the door. You can stop praying and let go of your point of view. Some of you, look, just one more thing talking about about this. Some of you just need to let go a little bit, change your mind on this whole forgiveness thing. You just, like, forgive your sister. Just let it go. Quit trying to make her pay for something that happened 15 years ago. Quit trying to make that person... See, in your mind, you think there's a reward for holding your unforgiveness. Your unforgiveness has literally magnetized you so you can't get the breakthrough. Let it drop. This is why Jesus said in Mark 11, when you're speaking to mountains, he said, when you speak to the mountain, it'll obey you. But when you stand praying, forgive. It's it's built right into the Lord's prayer. Father, forgive us as we forgive others, as we let it drop. You've got to let it drop. What you tolerate, you can never change. So, Peter's preaching his sermon to the people, and they're like, what shall we do? And he says, change your view. Until you change your view, ain't going to be no breakthrough. (laughs) Right? What shall we do? Pam, what shall we do? I got to change my view. Because until I change my view, ain't going to be no breakthrough. Right? Next time you're on Facebook, change your view. Oh, don't go there. Don't you go, don't you go talking about my Facebook. <laughs> this is what prayer and fasting is about. It's not, you can't impress God with how little you eat. You can't impress God with how much you pray. It's about using these tools to let go. Let go. Look, God has no problem with the breakthrough. He has no problem with your promotion. He has no problem with your healing. He has no problem with all the good stuff. Eye has not seen, ear has not heard, neither has it entered into the heart of man. The good things that God's prepared for you, hid away for you, treasured up for you. He has no problem getting this stuff to you. It's me and you. We come, we come to a place of decision, and we're like, well, I, I got my point of view here, and I really want to go through the door, but got this point of view and it's you know I think it's important my grandma gave it to me and you know it's I'm, it's kind of sentimental and I've kind of you know we, we we have a Thanksgiving tradition with my point of view and it's like let it drop let it go yeah some of you you've even just it's something even good and you just won't even let go of good so that you can have great you've fallen in love with what's good today and you refuse to accept what's great tomorrow, Mm -hmm. and you want to pull it through the door. Sometimes you've got to let go of even the good things. What shall I do to get my breakthrough? I'm going to repent. I'm going to change my point of view. Now, number two, context. We'll talk about context. First one, you've got to repent, change your mind, context. Jesus said this in Matthew 6, 33. But Stephen, seek first the kingdom of God. And his righteousness and all these things shall be added unto you. Jesus didn't come to earth to give us a new religion. He came to redeem us and bring us back to the Father's kingdom. We don't need another religion. 
We've got the Father's kingdom, the king's domain. It's his context. It's his way of thinking and doing things. It's his system. It's a highly developed network and system. It's the king's algorithms. And when you step into them as a royal son of God, they all work for you. They're all, they all come under your dominion and authority because you are a king under the king of all kings. Isn't that good news? But here's what happens when you step out, when you take the king out of the kingdom. Look at Mark 6. Jesus returns to his hometown only to have his neighbors fall under the trap of world, worldly sense and reason over his identity. So they dishonor Jesus and they disqualify themselves when they refuse the kingdom of God in their midst. And even though they have king of all kings standing in the middle of them, look at what happens. They hold Jesus apart from his kingdom. They hold the master in contempt because of their unbelief. And what's the outcome? No breakthrough, no open door for the miraculous. Mark 6, verse 5. Now Jesus could do no mighty work there except that he laid his hands on a few sick people and healed them. My friend, are you seriously willing to let 36 inches to keep you from your breakthrough? Are you honestly going to let 36 inches keep you from standing in the context of God's kingdom? No, no, I'm not. And I, I remember, no, I'm not. But, um, you know, I, I, I'm reminded of, of when Paul, the Apostle Paul, was, was praying for people, if you read in the Word. A couple other disciples, too, but Paul really did this. He said he would pray this so consistently. He'd say, Lord, I pray that you would open their eyes to see and perceive what you've already done for them. See, he said, Lord, I pray that you would open their eyes to see what you've already done for them, the breakthrough that you've already brought to them. And what I'm starting to realize is the way of God, the kingdom of God is, is his way of thinking, his way of doing things. And like what Stephen said, if I'm not willing to submit myself and understand and have my eyes opened to what God has already done, his way of thinking, his way of doing things, if I'm not in the way of God, his kingdom, then I can't bring the will of God to my life and to you and to people that I love so much. You know, I have so many friends that have kids and, you know, they'll go, we don't do it that way in this house. We do it this way in our house, right? You say, this is the way we do it in our house. We're, we're kind, we're loving. What, and, you know, there's a way in the kingdom of God, a way of thinking of God and a way of doing things that when we are willing to get into the kingdom of God, then the second is the will of God will be accomplished in our life and your kids' lives and our family's life and the city's <coughs> life and our nation's life. And that's when the way of God will give way to the will of God. Amen. Listen, look, think about it. If you hold Jesus, the king of all kings, out of the kingdom, like they did in Mark 6, and Jesus can do nothing among them. Look, it, things haven't changed. There's, there's people that say they believe in Jesus, they believe on Jesus, but they have no respect of the kingdom, the yeah. king's domain. You see what I'm saying? Yeah. They, they say they have respect for the king, but they have no respect for his context, for his domain. And it literally says in Mark 6 that he could do nothing. For, there, it was such a contemptible situation. It was such an environment of unbelief. Jesus, the king of eternity, could do nothing for them. Well, it's kind of like a fish out of water. Exactly. Look, a fish in water. If you ever watch those TV shows where you got a fish moving around in water and you see the genius of them navigating and moving around and living life and jumping and, and turning corners and all this kind of stuff, you're like, wow, it's just, they're acrobatic. They're amazing. You take that salmon and you pull them out of the water and you put them in the context of just a few feet. Maybe that's our 36 inches just on the beach there. And suddenly you're like, oh my goodness, he's just he can't, like he's dying. I'm not a fish expert, but that thing looks like it's dying. That doesn't look right. It looks like he's living hard, doesn't he? He's, his gills are flapping, but you can tell he's suffocating. It's not going good. You can be royalty. You can be bought with a price far above silver and gold. You can be a child of God, but be pulled out of context, not living kingdom first. And you can be that fish with your gills flapping and wondering why. I don't understand why life is hard. I don't understand why when I pray, she gets praise and she gets answers. What's wrong with me? Seek first God's, the king's domain. Context is everything. Say that. Context is everything. Context is everything. 
You cannot live life as a fish and be void of water. You can't live outside the water and think things are going to go well and then start getting all critical about your fish design. No, no, no. You can't get all critical about your design. You're made in the image of God. You're made to win, made to prosper. But you've got to be. See, Jesus came to give us back context. For thousands of years, we didn't have context. We gave it away to the enemy. And now Jesus came to give us back to kingdom. Remember, he says to the people, he says, my little children, don't be afraid. Oh, why? Has he got some good things for us? Jesus says, don't be afraid because it's our Father's good pleasure to give you the kingdom. But there's a way of doing things. Absolutely. And, and like what you mentioned even about forgiveness, that's such a key of getting in God's way of thinking. First John 2.11 says this, he who hates his brother is in darkness. It's like saying this, when I hate my brother, I just jumped out of context and I'm that fish laying on the beach dying. Yeah. He who hates his brother lives in darkness. Well, not even hates his brother, but, you know, holds offense. We all get offended. People hurt us, you know, and you get offended. But I, I'm realizing if I hold offense, if I am not willing to celebrate or honor other people and I'm trying to put them down or whatever, <laughs> if I hold anger and unforgiveness in my heart, I'm realizing that's an antichrist way of doing things. And we always hear about this antichrist. It's an antichrist way of doing things. It's an anti-kingdom of God way of doing things. And how can I ever expect that the will of God would be done in my life and for the people I love if I'm not willing to stay away from the antichrist way of doing things, but I do things the way of God, the way he's thinking. Here's your things. door to your breakthrough. And the thing is, like I said, this door to this breakthrough will always be, like Pam was talking about, you're either working, flowing with Christ, or you suddenly pick up something in your life that's opposed to the anointing, anti-Christ. You come to this door, it's always the anointing that gives you the breakthrough. It's always the anointing that you're partnered with that moves you through the door. And if you stand here trying to drag your offense through, if you're trying to drag your unforgiveness through, you can fast for all of 2018. And you're still going to be on this side of the door. Let it drop. That's why the Bible even says when you come to church and you have an offering, you've got a gift to give. It says at the back of the door there, let go of your offenses. Make it right with your brother and then bring your gift because God wants to guarantee the harvest on your gift. He wants you to get the reward of your giving. Yeah. But you've got to let it drop before you walk through the door. The door will not allow that unforgiveness, that bitterness, that resentment to go through it. And sometimes here lately, uh, for the last six months, I've been, when, when something offends me or hurts me or everything, I'll just, I'll speak to my mind just like David did. And I said, mind in the name of Jesus. You have the mind of Christ. You were led by Holy Spirit, Pam. And I'll say, mind, I command you to get into the kingdom of God's way of thinking and the will of God towards this person. And you know what? Maybe the first time I did it, it's something, but honestly, like within a hours or a day all of a sudden I'm looking at this person different and I'm seeing things that the Lord wants me to pray for and the Lord even it seems like changes them but I'm a different person and and I I, I watch as the will of God is accomplished in an easy way for me you know the, the other day I got cut off in traffic now I know most of you guys when you get cut off in traffic you pull over and you have a time of prayer and you begin to intercede for them <laughs> I love that about you but I'm just telling you honestly my flesh my flesh you is, did good I didn't do my it. flesh comes up to an ugly door at that moment when somebody cuts me off in traffic my flesh comes up to an ugly door and I got a choice right now I got a chance to recognize this as a door of opportunity into more or to get stuck and this is why the Bible says bless those who curse you I love blessing those who curse me because as I drop off the junk I step through into more I want to recognize, you've got to recognize the door to more. It's not always pretty. It's not always this beautiful thing. Sometimes it's a giant. Sometimes it's somebody flipping you the bird when you're driving down the road. But you've got to recognize the door to more, and you've got to step on through. You've got to let it go. Quickly drop. You've got to pull a Jesus and bless those who curse you. See, that's kingdom. That's context. You've just made context for your miracle right in your life. Sometimes people, look, when we were in Nashville, 
we had somebody steal a large amount of money from us. And we, we went to God. We were just newly married. We were just kind of like figuring this whole thing out. And we were like, God, what do we do? And the Lord was like, forgive them and bless them. Forgive them, let it drop, bless them. Now, you don't have to be in relationship with them anymore. You don't have to be in business relationship, but you got to let it drop and you got to walk through the door. And when we did that, God restored more than what they had even stolen from us. But you've got to know how to walk through the door. Yeah, that's right. True worship. Now, you're going to be excited about this one. Point three, true worship, yeah, right? right? True worship. We just had a great time of worship here this morning, but I want to amp things up for you. How many know in 2018, you're worshipers, but you can take it to a whole nother level? Isn't that right? And I'm not talking about you singing louder, although I love it when you sing loud. We're not talking about you, you know, jumping up and down, but that's great when you jump up and down. Let's take a look at Paul and Silas and what they knew about worship opening doors. In Acts 16, Paul and Silas, they're preaching the gospel. They're having a big revival meeting. In fact, they got this little slave girl who's possessed with demons. They get her set free from demons, right? Well, instead of them taking up an offering for them, guess what they do? They take Paul and Silas out back and they beat the tar out of them. That's a really tough evangelistic crowd. They take them out back and they whoop them, they beat them, and then they take them to the warden of the prison and they throw them in prison, and not just any place in prison, they want them put in the lowest part of the prison. They shackle their feet so they're hurt even more. And we pick up the story right here at Acts 16, verse 25, and about the midnight hour when Paul and Silas were praying and singing hymns of praise. You've got to be kidding. Who does that? Who takes a whooping and starts singing praises? Paul and Silas. Not because they were just kind of silly religious people. They knew a secret. They knew a secret that when you practice the presence of God, God shows up and where the spirit of the Lord is, there is. So they're singing hymns, songs of praise to God and the prisoners were listening to them. And suddenly there was a great earthquake so powerful that the very foundations of the prison were shaken. All at once the doors opened and everyone's chains were unfastened. Paul and Silas weren't singing because they felt like it. They knew the laws of breakthrough, that worship has rewards that opens up breakthrough doors. Isn't that good? Listen to this. The Hebrew word for worship, I think this is just so cool. The Hebrew word for worship is made up of three Hebrew letters that they they pronounce it shaka, or probably look far more Jewish than I do. Anyway, the worship word is shaka. The first two letters make up the word for humility, which means to bow down and break through a barrier. Bow down and break through a wall. Humility. Then the last letter is the letter He in Hebrew, which basically is a picture of a man or a woman standing with their hands upright like this under an open heaven and the word behold. So you take the word worship and it is to bow down low, break through a wall and behold, right? To bow down low, to humble yourself, to bow down low, come through the door, come through the wall, break through the wall and behold. Behold what? Whatever it is you're believing God for, your reward. You see, when we worship God, we honor God when we worship God with an expectation. Hebrews 11:6 6 says, without faith, it's impossible to please God. For when you come to God, you got to believe that he is and that he's the rewarder. Yeah. He's the rewarder of those that seek him, that worship him. Because when we sing about the goodness of God, you know, sometimes I think it's very easy. I don't know about you, but it's very easy for us to sing about the problem. But when we sing about the goodness of God and mercy of God, breakthrough always happens. I was in, um, singing in South Africa. I did a tour over there, and they had been in a horrible drought. I didn't know it. But the Christians were really praying, Lord, give us a breakthrough. Give us some rain because it was pretty bad. And so I think it was the second concert, outdoor concert. The first couple songs, I was singing about the goodness and mercy of God, and they were singing with me. And it came to the third song, and the song got to the chorus. And the chorus is, it's starting to rain. It started to rain. (laughs) It started to pour. And people were dancing all around, and they were like the entire tour, it rained. And they were saying, let's bring this girl back from America. She makes it rain, you know? It really wasn't me, boy. I was singing about the goodness and the mercy of God. They joined in to me. Then when we declared what was God's will, it happened. And I think, you know, I remembered of Jehoshaphat in the Bible. Um, 
he was a king of Judah, and these terrorists were against him. They were, had him holed up in their city. They were threatening to kill him, to torture him, um, took all their food away. They were starving. And so King went to God, and he said, God, I need an answer. You know, give us a breakthrough. And God answered King Jehoshaphat. You know, sometimes I think we cry out to God for breakthrough, but do, do we listen when he gives us the answer? And God gave King Jehoshaphat the answer, and he said, this is what I want you to do. I want you to get all the singers together, and I want you to put them out front, and I want you to have them sing about my goodness and my mercy and my faithfulness, and you watch yeah. what I'm going to do. And it says in the Bible that they fought, the enemy fought among themselves. They destroyed themselves. Not one of God's people was hurt. And then all the spoil, all the riches of the terrorist, it took God's people three days to pick up all the rewards from them declaring and speaking God's goodness and God's mercy. Isn't that awesome? That's Three days reward. picking up the rewards. Always, always, always worship God intentionally. What yeah. do I mean by that? Be vertically reward motivated. Always worship God looking to heaven for the reward. Because if you aren't intentional about your worship, all of a sudden that vertical will go down a horizontal and you'll begin to do the right things for the wrong reasons. You begin to worship God so that maybe just for, for the appearance of it, what it looks like or what it sounds like, or I hope, you know, I'm just kind of filling my, filling my religious calendar and just trying to do my checklist. See, the woman at the well, she was intolerant of that. She said, we've done that. We, us Samaritans, we've already had our case, our fill of religion. You Jews, apparently you're doing the same thing because you got nothing. Sir, you're a prophet. You hear from God. Please tell us, how do we worship so that we get an outcome? God wants you to experience an outcome. It's God's greatest pleasure to be believed. You know, sometimes we do this. We, 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 we give God, we, we say, well, I, I love God with all my heart. God says, I want to be believed. For he that comes to God must believe that he is and that he's the rewarder. Sometimes we come to God and we want to give God all of our love. And it's a little bit like what we're pulling from our broken relationships here on earth. You know, I call it that Uncle Frank syndrome. No offense if your name's Frank, but everybody has that Uncle Frank that's a little bit inappropriate at dinner parties and a little bit inappropriate at any family get-together. But we all love him. Man, we love Uncle Frank, but nobody trusts him as far as you can throw him. And then we take that broken kind of... Um, codependent love that we have here on earth and we try to give that love to God and it's like on a Sunday morning oh I love God with all my heart I don't trust him completely but I love him with all my heart and look, that's what's that's what's that's the key is trusting God the key look this is what John did John kept saying there was me Peter I mean there was Peter James and the disciple that G Jesus loved so much me John put all of his confidence in God's love Peter kept trying to convince Jesus how much he loved Jesus. Look, you and I, we got to trust God. We, we bring our adoration to God. We, we, we bring joy to Father's God when we expect him to do what he said he was going to do. When we put faith and confidence and trust in him. Remember what Hebrews eleven six 6 says, without faith, it's impossible to please God. It didn't say without love, it's impossible. He is love. Look, if you're loving God, it's because God first loved you. Isn't that what 1 John says? Herein is that we love God, that he first loved us. If I'm giving God ice cream, it's because God gave me ice cream. But the one thing that you have that God does not have, it's your trust. It's your confidence, your trust. And so to put 100% of your trust equity in God is the ultimate act of worship. And so here's what we do in Hebrews 11:6. 6. When we come to God, we believe that he is and that he's a rewarder of those that diligently seek him. I want the band to come out. We're going to worship the Lord. Does that sound good? Can we, can we put into practice what we've been talking about? Can we truly worship God? And I know that your worshiper is here, but can we take it to another level? And by another level, can you raise your expectations for what God is going to do in your life in 2018? God wants to do something brand new, something miraculous. He wants to give you this walkthrough, breakthrough, this door, but it's going to require you. You truly worshiping, stepping through and letting go of the stuff, letting go of the past, letting go of even what's good for what's great, letting go 
know of some of the offenses. You know, the word singing in the Hebrew, it literally means, um, it's pronounced zamir, and it means to sing, but it also means to separate the wheat from the grain, to chat, this, this, this separation that happens. When we worship God, there is a separation that goes on in our heart, and God removes the wheat from the chaff so that you can have that breakthrough. Can we just worship God now this morning? Can we stand to our feet, and can we just give Him all praise and adoration? Can we know that God's got a breakthrough for us right now in Jesus' a name? Joy. Thank There's you, a joy. Thank you, Father. There's a joy. Hallelujah. Holy, holy, God Almighty, the great I am, who is worthy, none beside me, God Almighty, great I am. Come on, sing it. Let's sing that bridge together. Shake before us, the demons howl and bleed at the mention of the King, King of Majesty. There is no power in hell or any who can stand before the power and the presence of the Great I Am, the Great. the last, the beginning and the end. You are the author and the finisher of our faith. And Jesus, even you, for the joy set before you, you endured the cross. You were reward motivated for us, adopting us into your family. So we bring great honor to Father God when we raise our expectation and when we are reward motivated even in our worship of you, Father God. We're expecting in the presence of Almighty God for change to fall off. Lord, doors to swing open, Lord God. Offenses, Lord, to disintegrate, Lord God. Our mind to be melted back into the mind of Christ and to be renewed, to be restored. Father, to be redeemed, to be brought back to the kingdom way of thinking. Father God, we announce right now in the name of Jesus the very keys of the kingdom, the very algorithms of heaven. We pronounce them in this place. Father, as we step out of this old year and into the new one, Father, we give you glory and we speak we order and we say, order. let there be light, yes. let there be illumination, Father God. 
Let there be order, kingdom order here on earth as it is in heaven. And Father, we ask that you be glorified in every life, every family present here, Lord God. Thank you. Father, we announce the wisdom of God. And Lord, even as we gather together this Wednesday, Father God, at this prayer meeting, Lord God, we pray that already, Father God, your presence, Lord, begins to work in our lives and in our hearts. And Lord, as we come together and we worship you, Lord, it will truly be pleasing in your sight because, Lord, we'll be with such faith, Lord, knowing and believing that you are, but that you are the rewarder of those that diligently seek you, those that diligently worship you, those that call on, I am the great I am. Father, we thank you and we praise you for this. We announce your blessing on this body going into 2018 in Jesus' precious name. Now, I just want to let you know, I just, we, we put together just a little bit of, I guess you'd call it refrigerator art or something like that, but you can go to Mount Hope's website. It's right up there. They got the directions. And you can get this um, one sheet, we call it, with those three points, with three or four scriptures on repenting, three or four scriptures on context, and three or four scriptures on uh, true worship. And you know what Pam and I like to do is we like to take those scriptures and we like to read them in the first person so we speak them over them um, ourselves. Like we like to speak, you know, Philippians 2 and say, we have the mind of Christ. We are led and by we're the led Holy by Spirit, the Holy yeah. Spirit. And so we put together some of those keys that God's given us over the years that we like to speak into our life that illuminate the situation that, that help announce and quicken in our hearts the, the opportunity of recognizing what a door is to our breakthrough. And so you can download those, put and print them out, put them on your mirror, put them on your fridge. Remember to pick up the one-year Bible. You want to get this, right? Your mind's renewed as you wash it with the Word of God. Pastor Kevin's made this available at the Resource Center, so you want to get one of these, the one-year Bible, and kick into gear with that. You want to make sure you're here this Wednesday night and get your heart, raise it up with expectations. But, you know, like we always tell all of our worship team and our worship leaders backstage, we're reminding them every Sunday, every Wednesday, raise your expectations. Why are you worshiping? Why are you going out? Troy, why are you doing sound this morning? Why are our guys doing lights? Don't expect a horizontal reward. Look for a vertical reward. Father God wants to reward you. You know, thank God for these guys because when they lead you in worship every Sunday, their expectations are raised up from the miracles in your life. They're believing for signs and wonders. They want that truck driver on the third row completely healed, restored, his marriage put back together. So they're believing for signs and wonders to follow. Isn't that a good thing? Yeah. Isn't that good to know? They're not just singing for you to hear them sing. They're not just doing sound for you because it's a good Sunday morning thing to do. They're doing stuff for, for unto God because they're looking for the heavenly rewards. So when you come in here on a Sunday morning, you should be expecting your body to be completely healed and set free. Isn't that good? Yeah.